the last week, I think, has been very uh, illuminating in terms of how this is all going with tornadoes and floods and so on and so forth. It's getting a little bit difficult to um, try to say that we're not having problems. And music as a vehicle of emotional expression has been used to represent and reflect the trauma caused by climate change. Now music, okay, it can and should be enjoyed simply for its own sake. But it also makes sense for us to harness the power of music because it's uh, of the benefits that it can, can bring and to try to help us solve the world's problems. Uh, musicians and composers are looking at how music might be of some value here. Now, at first glance, music might seem to be an odd way to solve a problem. And the notion that music could be viewed as an important tool in addressing climate change might even seem naive. After all, we should leave the studying of the climate crisis to uh, climate scientists and so on. But uh, the field of environmental psychology has grown and uh, now tackles human behavior in relation to climate change. The importance of this is recognized by organizations like the British Psychological Society and music psychology is a behavioral science and could also embrace this challenge. In addition, the climate crisis is such a serious problem that we need to use everything at our disposal, disposal to try to find solutions. So a number of composers and performers around the world have stepped up to take on the challenge of using their creative skills to talk about climate change. And we have here today with us, an example. Kathy DeWitt is a nationally published writer, producer, award-winning jazz composer, and a songwriter. Some of you who've been here at OCAC for a while may have had a chance to hear Kathy perform before. She tells me she has uh, frequently been at OCAC and uh, particularly for New Year's Eve, is that right? <laughs> yeah. You'll have the big New Year's Eve party? Yeah, yeah. played those for like 14 years. <laughs> she is the band leader for the Jazz Quartet Moon Dancer and the all woman folk bluegrass band Patchwork. And her presentation today will focus on how she has used music to raise awareness of environmental and climate issues and to help protect the natural beauty of Florida. Please help me welcome Kathy Duet. Valerie. Um, that's been going on for a long time. People using music to yeah. create awareness of certain issues. You know, there's all the old folk music that was the anti war back in the 60s and 70s, and the environmental issues have been a cause for concern for quite some time now. And like Mallory said, people all over the world have been doing, using their art. Um, even like Peter Carroll and his beautiful paintings of the beauty here in Florida, that's, that helps to keep you aware of what we have here in Florida. We have this natural beauty. And um, my purpose today is to share and demonstrate how music can be used to raise awareness of our, our environmental issues and the need to preserve our resources and uh, the subject of climate change is huge, but the way that people really create change, like what Mallory was saying, it's working with your own local issues and working in your own environment and working in your own home to do what you can do to help with this with this problem. Kathy, is your lapel on? Just checking. Um, let me see. I thought it was, but it seems to be. Wouldn't like to stay on very long. It is on though, but um, maybe I have to get okay. Get it closer. I'm gonna turn this up. We'll get closer to it. Like it's right here. Does that make any difference? Yes. And we have that little light right by the Which one's the lights down a little bit? Oh, okay. Oh, that's right. 
So whenever I come to those hammock, I always like to ask. <laughs> It's the mic. Is he just oh do you just just take it? No, I turned it up for you, but oh yeah. Can't go too far with that. No. See. It's kind of a tricky situation here. We need two mics separately. There's one that's going to be for the guitar and one that's going to be for my voice. So if they get too close to each other, they, uh, they have a tendency to talk to each other. <laughs> and you call that feedback. Oh, that's too loud. Um, I just, maybe I won't turn this. Maybe I won't need this for the guitar. I'll just use it for the uh, when I use the boom box. This is a thing called a boombox or CD player. Anybody remember these? <laughs> so I brought some recorded music to play for you all because there's a lot of people that are they're doing this kind of music and kind of trying to create change and awareness with their music. But um, since I'm from Florida, I'm a native Floridian. I thought I'd start with a song that I wrote about Florida called My Heart Belongs to Florida, her oceans, her rivers, and her springs. In the winter of the fall, you can hear those sandals fall and see the great blue bird on the wing. This is where the banjo comes in. So imagine. <laughs> well, I love doing things I've never done before. I love seeing things I've never seen before. I've traveled to my highways, sailing in Hawaii, and I've been to Florida. I've been to Florida. I'm a Oh, yeah. How about the, nat the national uh, state parks? State parks. 
Our state parks here are like golden golden award winners. Kind of like when they give the golden spoon to the restaurants, <laughs> but it's a little bit different. But um, yeah, recently there was a big a big to do about the state parks. And I don't know if y'all heard about this or not, but there was uh, all of a sudden this plan showed up to put hotels, golf courses, and pickleball courts, not mm -hmm. the people love pickleball, but the golf, but to put them in all the state parks. Right. Well, we already have a lot of those things all around the state of Florida, and the state parks kind of have a different purpose. They're here to give us a chance to get out in nature and experience the beauty of the natural environment and all that sort of thing. So, and to preserve the environment. Yeah. So when um, when the word kind of leaked out about this plan, there was an uproar, like like Mallory was talking about, where people come together to create change and. Um, you know, how many people been to the beach that's still around here? The Atlantic Beach is like St. Augustine and uh, Crescent Beach and uh, the Amelia Island and all that. And Crystal River. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, those are all different places where they're planning on doing this. There's parks all over Florida, including Anastasia in St. Augustine. So the people over there, within one day, they were out on the street, a thousand people. <laughs> holding a sign saying save our parks save anastasia you know forget your stupid plan <laughs> <laughs> and um it really did cause them the powers that be to pull that plan back and say oh you know yeah well, we were just we were just kidding about that we didn't really know exactly what we were going to do yet so I uh, I didn't get too involved in that. I had a lot of friends who were over there because I know a lot of folks who live in St. Augustine, and they were um, out there holding signs and everything. Meanwhile, you know, right now with this storm, St. Augustine once again got pretty badly flooded because of the river right in town and the ocean right close by. There's always a bit of a storm surge. So even though this storm really was in the Gulf and came from the Gulf, because it crossed the state, it went over into the Atlantic a bit too. It went across that Atlantic coast enough to mess around with some of those towns over on that side too. Um, so these more severe and frequent storms do seem to be um, related to the global warming and the climate change because the Gulf waters were so warm that now the storms were able to form and increase and they've got the warm Gulf water carrying them. So that's just one thing. I heard a song about um, well, going to the beach from here in Gainesville, you know, you might go Daytona, or you might go to St. Augustine and Jacksonville Beach, and you might go down through some of the towns down there, but most likely to get to the beach from here, you're going to go through Palatka. And I wrote a song about that. Is anyone here from Palatka? No. I was that big sure. So. This is my song called Ode to Palatka. The French title is Ode de Palatka with the EAU. <laughs> If on some bright and sunny day something inside you seems to say that it's time to read something from salty air. <laughs> Your car and go to the garage. The ocean's already bound to the garage. Don't come to the garage. Just pass on your way back to the garage. And tell them that I'm slowing to reach the black thing. That's certainly something something in the air. It's within your nostrils, rich as your body and full of change. Well, thank God you're more than half turned to the garage. 
Janet Rucker, and she's, she's written some beautiful songs about Florida that inspired me to write my beautiful Palaka song. So I'm going to play a little bit of her song for you that's kind of more specific about some of the things we love here in Florida. Um, I'm not sure. This will be a good chance to test the volume on this thing, too, to see if y'all can hear it. You're all the way in the back. I don't know. It might not work as well for you. So I'm Janet song, Florida Home. There's so much in you, the wild prairie and the sea goes to there are falls and rivers and bayous of Florida, the whole wide world. When the sky is streaked with the setting sun's gold, Love all my wings away like and the air smells like honey, like Charlie. The whole life shows. So There's so much in you, my friend. And the sea goes to the forest and rivers and leaves of the world 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 Song. And um, 
I had a songwriting class. I was doing at the senior center for a while before the pandemic. Uh, in fact, it started in 2014, I think. And then when the pandemic came, we all we went to Zoom, and it's still on Zoom now. But uh, when this was at the senior center, more people seemed to come. You know, um, although the Zoom is kind of nice because people can come from farther away, so you've got that. But there was one woman who came, and she uh, was a writer, Marjorie Abrams. She's got some books out. She's written about Florida. And there was a fellow in Ocala who was who, who wanted to build a big cattle ranch and a slaughterhouse on this land with a big with a a beautiful spring on it. Once again, <laughs> there was a lot of uh, dispute about this. And um, this woman in my class, she wrote a song. She wrote the words and I put up the music. But she wrote all these words about this place called Sleepy Creek. And I'm about to play a little bit of that for you. Yeah. He made lots of bucks on the autos and the horses, walking some North Florida land and country golf courses. So the story goes. Daughter, so the story goes. Try to name play back. Spent a month in Canada, had plans that were quite grand. But when people heard about his plan, they joined to take a stand. He'd raise a herd 10,000 strong, build a house for slaughter. The problem was to do the job he did, most all our water. And so the water goes, so the water goes. In his defense, he said his ranch would be ideal. He'd raise the finest beef using grass and not cornmeal. The aquifer would only shed 30 million gallons a day. People's protests grew, they demanded to have a say. To join the springs and streams if Medina had its way. And down the water goes, down the water goes, deep in the sink and leaves us less to drink. The billionaire from Canada came up with different schemes. First, he said he'd parcel the land and then use different streams. He'd had his way before and was on a lucky streak. To stop the protest, he changed his plan and named the ranch Sleepy Creek. So the water goes, and so the water goes. Well, no Sleepy Creek ain't sleepy. They know where it ain't no creek. Seems a lovely girl, and Dina has a papa who's a sneak. He's trying to put one over, thinks the folks who fight won't know. Our lakes and streams are all too low, and his cattle ranch has got to go. That ranch has got to go. Sleepy Creek has got to go. Medina Ranch has got to go.
after that, they tried moving it to uh, near Flemington, yeah. outside McNerby, and we cut him off at the knees there, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we ain't told you to move on. So back in a, I belong to an organization called FDE, Florida Defenders of the Environment. It's been around for a very long time. Actually, it was started by Marjorie Carr. Mm -hmm. And her main goal was to bring down the Rodman Dam. And that's been the goal of FDE now for decades. And these days, with the hurricanes, there's a lot more terrible looking at the dams. Dams all over the country are they're getting old, you know. They're getting a little more dangerous. And these storms aren't helping any. <laughs> so there's more... Um, there seems to be more support now for the idea of bringing down the dam here in uh, on along the St. John's River, which really only off the Waha, but the Hawke Waha, St. John's, and the Silver River are all being together. So there's been a lot of people writing about that, and we had this project, Steve Robitaille, who started the FDE, um, started a project called Natural Court. Its purpose was to educate children in schools. And um, we used actually all kinds of art. We used all the visual art, photographers, painters who were painting and making art about Florida. We used the musicians. I was creating music for this project for the musicians who were writing about Florida. Poets like Lola Hoskins and other people who wrote poems. Um, you were involved. In your idea, I love your idea about the river going on the St. John's. Um, so that was going on for a while. And uh, so through that, I got, got, got to know many people who were, um, you know, writing and singing and painting about Florida. Then I became involved in, um, I was already involved in this folk music scene we have in Florida, which is kind of unusual. We have the oldest folk festival that's been continuously running in the whole country over 70 years now. The one they have at White Springs every year on Memorial Day weekend, which is really awesome. But there's also a really nice festival in um, down around Dade City called the Will McLean Festival. Named for this man, Will McClain, who wrote a lot of songs about Florida, and he actually became like a catalyst for all these other people to write songs about Florida. They started having a contest every year, and uh, he and his other cronies and older folks about who wrote about the state were trying to recruit and motivate younger people to get involved in this whole movement, too. Um, but Will has a kind of a captivating voice. Um, so I thought I'd play this song for you. The legend about this song, Florida Sand, is that after he came back from serving in the army, he said if he ever got back to Florida, he was going to kiss the ground. And he did. <laughs> That's the word. That's the word on the street. Well, let's see what comes up next. Um, In summer or winter, the ocean is calling me back to Florida sand, 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 to Florida sand, sand, sand. The wind and the ocean are calling me back. To the sand, 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 to the world of the sand, sand, sand. The wings of this far moon, beneath the bright moon, night birds are crying, 
return to me soon. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, my heart you remember, for always the love of this man is flawless sand. Sand, sand is flawless sand. Sand, sand. That's what we're saying. How many people remember um, Bill Beck at, at the Classic 89 at WUSD? He was kind of the program manager. I had my show across the prairie on the radio there. He was, he was my boss. and. Um, he came across this recording of Will McClain somewhere in the archives over there. <laughs> and uh, he just fell in love with his voice and the whole Florida music scene. So so he got very involved in that and in, in um, my show across the prairie and finding music for me to play and um, recording what was happening at these Florida folk festivals that were going on. And um, that was, uh, you know, kind of a, a high point about about all that. And it it created more more and more, you know, motivation for people. And a uh, guy, Bob Patterson, wrote a song called Lullaby of the Rivers that names all the rivers, which is quite, if you try to remember them all and even just say their names, you know, <laughs> it's pretty tricky. So he had a way to do it all with a song. And they're using it in a lot of schools. And, uh, I wrote a song about Major Tucky also getting used in the schools. And then many people have written about the Everglades. Uh, Dale Kreider, who was a biologist and worked for the Fish and Game Commission, you know, his career was really married to his love of the environment and, and preserving Florida and all that. So he did a lot of uh, he did a lot of interesting things about putting those two things together. This is one um that I wrote about the issue of Tuckney. It's a little more, it's a little more melancholy. <laughs> and, um, see. Shimmery, shining water, sparkling crystal clear as glass. Light on the edge of Tugney takes a speck to time well See the petals glimmer as canoes go gliding by. Can you hear the boat wakes murmur and the lonely wood owl cry? Fish the edge of me, catching fish in her clear stream. Then beside life giving waters, now those days are but a dream.
So much to us, these are help to fight the storm, to preserve her tranquil beauty and maintain her head springs pure and fearful. We must keep our emerald waters ever flowing, ever free, making sure the itches of the lives in water and memory. Memory. Yeah. Um, and you know if when it seems scary like these things are going to be gone you know then people just like the thing with the state parks will become the government um so a lot of people write this write songs about our wildlife that we have here in florida you know florida the panther uh that called the Award. He's coming to be. Uh, he's coming to get an FDE award coming up next year, and he has a whole project about the Florida Panther, and he's taken a lot of amazing footage of them in the wild, and made a little film about it, and written a book about it. And, uh, there's Will McLean wrote a song about the sandhill cranes when he thought they were going to become extinct, and now look at them. These things can change, and we can have something to do with it. Um, and now, you know, we're not the only ones here in Florida. A few years ago, I uh, was up in New York, and my husband was working in the city, and I took a little train ride, and I came upon a flyer in the train station that said something about sailing trips on this boat, the Clearwater. So I found out more about this, and I went on this boat, and this was the boat that actually Pete Seeger um got funding to build and it made it became a project to clean up the river which was a mess the hudson river was like ge was like you know a lot of pollution was going into the water from them but other uh, just from everyone from everywhere and uh the clearwater would stop and give these concerts all along the ports and Kids would come from schools and um, they would. I, so, I, so I went on the boat, I went on a couple of these trips and performed these concerts with, you know, other more well known musicians from up there. And one other thing that I remember them doing was they had a big tank of water and they would fish stuff out of the water and it'd be in this tank and they'd go, and what does it belong here? And they'd have some fish and then there'd be like a big boot. You know, <laughs> all this different stuff, and it was pretty interesting. And um, I got to interview Pete. In fact, he he showed me his truck that was uh, electric. They were on gas. Look at all that that's going on. Now, this was before there was much of that going on. When what when was that? Do you remember? Um, when I was going on the Clearwater, I was probably. Probably the 90s or the late 80s or something like that. Yeah, probably the 90s, early 90s. 
but it was I was involved <laughs> in the photography for that. He wrote it back in the late 60s. Oh well, that's kind of when it was first happening. Yeah. Yeah. When we had high school kids from uh in and uh Kipsey. Right, Kipsey. Yeah. yeah. We were we were out doing photographs on the boat, what's good, what's not good. Oh, cool. I was at college. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, but Kipsey was uh, that was a big one of the main places where they would have their festivals and a lot of people mm -hmm. would come and that's where I interviewed Pete. Well, actually, it was the, the Beacon, the Beacon, oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Beacon Yacht Club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which was like quite a fun place. I have a little bit of that interview on here. It's kind of quiet, but I see the thing. You know, it's great to hear his voice. You know, he's got a very a memorable voice. <laughs> It's hard to see his numbers in the top of the idea for the third one. The third one is a good thing. Same as me, the period supplies the only place in the middle of the 19th century. But as it turned out, he decided to use the boat for a different purpose. That was a long story. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when the boat was launched, that's when the arguments began. <laughs> well, I would start a little bit before when he named it Clearwater because that then appeared that a whole batch of people. Who gave money to build this beautiful boat thought it should be a historical record and stay strictly away from the environment of con confrontation that would make the ill feel it. Let it be a thing of beauty and their model, they want this to be the, uh, the model, a graceful symbol of the past. <laughs> they want to call the boat heritage. But I'd say the younger people want to call it clear water and change the chart to say the purpose of clear water is to clean up the river. And they did. In fact, the clear water has been sailing the Hudson River Valley for over 30 years, doing environmental and educational programs for kids and adults, teaching them to take responsibility for keeping the river clean. Here in Florida, we have our own problems with keeping our beautiful rivers clean. He considered himself as no stranger with the river. He would be able to walk through the snow, perform the interviews, everything, and he would have to do the work of the community. I don't know where I can go, I don't know. Being on New York, I went down and then saying, I don't want to talk to concerts with me. Miami and all around those people, I think. But there's only people I know. Artists are lucky. The way we are. So he says, artists are lucky because their songs keep going on. You know, your songs are going to keep having an effect even after you're gone. So it's kind of a little motivation to um, play songs that you think will have an effect and make the world a better place in whatever way uh, is important to you. I found another thing that was pretty cool. There was a whole story in the in the Gainful Sun had the story about this group called Big Blue Sky. It was playing on a riverboat in Mississippi, on the Mississippi River, up in um, Iowa, and they've been doing it for like a few years. But, um, it was. And they did a song called Water Song. So the writer wrote a pretty good article about this, but um, I think it's kind of long to read the whole thing. And I couldn't really find a version of the song anywhere. But I like this one thing that it says about the band. Their songs aren't on Spotify, so listening to them on the river is a unique opportunity. And they sell the city, the proceeds go to the song the songwriter, leader of the band, has a bird conservation organization called Driftless Area Bird Conservation. And he's always out checking out all these different kinds of raptor birds and different birds and taking pictures of them and studying them. So um, their website 
is big blue sky dash d a b c dot com. The line went there, or you didn't find much. Um, but he said this song, Water Song, it gets played uh, every time they're on the boat. The only exception they ever make to the song, making a difference, is when he regularly would serve the name of whatever body of water they're putting on to remind the listeners that they need that river to live. And I do that too. When I play the Asian Company song, I tell people, I say, you can put whatever song you want to, whatever river you want to into this song. And I'll just finish with this little song about the Swanee that a friend of ours wrote. And that's what you can do. You can put whatever river is important to you, you can put it into this song. When I was a little girl, no bigger than a wagon spoke. Daddy moved our family to the town they call Live Oak Town. I didn't have to ask where it got its name. I was raised underneath the Live Oak tree. Growing up in Swanee County was the greatest life I knew. Daddy'd take me walking on Sunday afternoon. There were no secrets we couldn't share. The blues we could have walking on the banks of the Swanee. We walk the river banks of the Swanee River, of the Swanee River, river that I call home, river that I call home. So I was raised a country girl, then I moved away to the bright lights of the city, Gainesville. Where I still live today, but when those bright lights get me down in the east, I want to find a pull back to the river in the morning and walk the river banks of the Swanee River, of the Swanee River, the river that I call home, the river that I call home. I talked to dad the other day on the telephone. He said, you've been gone so long, girl. We miss you back home. There's catfish frying in the pan and cornbread in the oven. Your mama will set your place to the phone. We can walk the river banks of the Swanee River, of the Swanee River. River that I call home, river that I call home. Now when my life is over and I'm bound to the banks of Jordan River to St. Peter, I'm gonna sing. I appreciate your offer. Now please don't get me wrong, but the Jordan River, it's not my eternal throne. There's a place that I call heaven where my mom and dad go. If it's all right with you, I'd like to go home and walk the river banks of the Swanee River, of the Swanee River, river that I call home, river that I call home. You can sing along and you can put your favorite river in there. It doesn't even matter how many syllables. Sort of, we've got a lot of syllables in here. Please let me walk the river bank of the Swanee River, of the Swanee River, river that I call home, river that I call home. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Any questions or anything you want to ask her? Right behind you. Of course, I have to. <laughs> um, one of the things that I've been finding since we have made some some progress um, getting water to flow back to explain the mill, water to flow back into um, what used to be Lake Alachua, which is Paints Prairie. And I'm finding more and more I have to explain to people. They say, what's wrong? The prairie's wet. And I said, it's not a prairie. Well, it is a wet prairie. 
But, you know, we've had, if you want to write a song about that, yeah. we have a lot of problems getting people to uh, to figure out that that's the right thing that's happening. We got rid of those dams and, and oh, yeah. I know that in Somebody behind me, hold on a second. I must say that I'm conflicted about the dams. Hmm. I'm from Riverton, Vermont. And in Riverton, uh, the water in the spring after the ice would melt and all would come down into our town and flood it. Uh, and so the dam that was built when I was about six uh, really changed the, the village. And made it much more predictable and put me in the back of the feet. And walking out into this uh, area where the, yeah. the water would sometimes come all the way up to the first floor of the house. Yeah, people like having the water levels more steady. Yes. And the dams do enable that to happen. Yeah. The people that are concerned about the dams are really the ones who are downstream from it. Yeah, because then if it nothing happens, then the water would go rushing down that way. I don't know. It is it is a complicated issue. There are ways to make dams more animal friendly. Oh yeah, that's another thing. They're working on that, like with the manatees and the fish. They're trying to figure out if there's a way to let them go in and out. Well, they the trout, the yeah. trout did well, and, and they did balance the environment. So mm -hmm. it worked out. Yeah, some are better at that than others. Yeah. yeah. I've got this mic on, so I don't really need that, but if anybody else okay. wants to. Any other questions, comments? Um, does this, this go on? It just goes on and on. It goes it's on, on and on all day. All right. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, my father was with the Army Corps of Engineers. So they, he and my mother wandered around all over the country, and they called them the damn people. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> damn people. <laughs> Daddy was family cultural. <laughs> so uh, he he worked on Folsom Dam. That's how we ended up in California. But he was always so uh, totally irritated with the people who built on floodplain mm -hmm. down below the dam. Because he said, what the heck are you going to do if you have an earthquake? Right. He said, this dam is really well built, but it's not going to last, you know, forever. And then what? Or there a big problem there could be a huge storm. He had all the reasons why don't build below the dam, you know. So that was uh, an interesting lesson when I was growing up. <clears throat> Seems to work better when you go towards the front, in my experience, but yeah. it's there. But, uh, at, at any rate, maybe, maybe associated with the volume. Um, here, El Hammock, Hawaii, um, I was contemplating the fact that St. Petersburg got almost 20 inches of rain in a day, and I wondered what that would do here and how the drainage goes to the prairie ultimately. Um, also, we are in the uh, Saranola for uh, for well, Woods here, the forest, and uh, the other characteristic of Climate change is uh, dry periods, and if there is a fire, and I wondered if um, fire would be a problem for us in this sort of forest. Well, we don't have that much time. water, you know, like St. Pete, it's all water on mm -hmm. both sides. Yeah. That's my hometown. I'm really sad about it. But also, look at Asheville. Mm -hmm. Of course, Asheville has a big river, and that's what happened. That French Broad River overflowed its banks. And Destroyed the town. It's in the valley, beautiful. So it's just horrifying. Yeah. So I don't know, you know, maybe the results of climate change are definitely not always seen ahead of time. No. Still finding out some. Yeah. I do want to mention that um, I've written a series of novels uh, that have to do with different environmental issues. And the uh, first one was called Epiphany's Gift. And uh, the, the third one that I wrote was called Saturday's Tavern. 
and it is here in set here in Florida, and it's about uh, two things. One is the the story about building uh, ranches and slaughterhouses and so on on the edge of springs, and the other has to do with the illegal trade in fossils. So Santa Cruz Cavern, if you're interested at all, you know I'm not trying to uh, take advantage of the situation, but I really think it's a good book, <laughs> and it does uh, cover some of these. Um, you know, problems. And the other books also feature different environmental issues. So anyhow, try to do my part as a, an artist and a writer to uh, work with some of these topics. Okay, anything else that wants to add? You no, know, I interviewed an Anderson Peeler and um, that was fun. Yeah. He, you know, had a very long companionship for many years. And, um, and he was here in Florida when I went and interviewed him. He was uh, he was talking about two things, and he said, you know, in up north where he's from, Minnesota, then he said, an apple needs a good frost to really get it right. And he said, and, and I think that's true for people too. <laughs> people develop more character when they have to, you know, go through a frost or a freeze. Or he said, you know, you'll never be driving down the street and the snow and see somebody walking and not offering him a ride. You know, it's just how it is in those kind of environments. And then he said, what I don't really get is the people in Florida building on the beach, building all their houses on sand. Don't they read the Bible? <laughs> you build your house on sand, build your house on rock. So, you know, that's what people advise on their issues too. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> good advice. <laughs> well, you've really gotten to be a lot of good people. Sea Bird and Garrison. Well, yeah, I'm a journalist, so I go and interview people whenever I can. I love um, getting their stories. You feel very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, Kathy, I'm so uh, thank you very much. Delighted. Thank you. you were able to join us today. Thank you so much.